when we all look at our own lives as we get older, there's that sort of sense of, yeah, you, it's a journey that's an acceptable thing, indeed a proper thing to do. How dull we are if we stay the same and all believe the same things that we believed when we, when we were young. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alan Little, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the book festival. <laughs> no, it's really lovely to see you all. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Kez Dugdale. I'm the director of the John Smith Centre at the University of Glasgow. But I know that you are all here to see this man, Justin Webb who has, for the past four decades, been one of the best-known names on our TV screens and on our airwaves. He has travelled the world, bringing the news to your TVs and to your radio stations. And now he has written this wonderful book that we are here to talk to today, The Gift of a Radio, My Childhood and Other Train Wrecks. <laughs> so some brutal honesty right uh, on the front cover there. It is, of course, a memoir. It spans the whole of the 1970s. It's a sad story, but it's, it's not a sad book. And I really hope that over the course of the next 60 minutes that we have together, you will laugh uh, and that you will get some real insights into the 1970s and those early years of Justin's life. So, so Justin, right on the front cover here, there's a picture of you in a very snazzy green jumper. <laughs> and I understand this is the only remaining picture of your childhood. What does that tell us? About it's not only the only remaining picture, it's the only picture. That, that's what life was like in the 70s. We didn't take pictures of each other endlessly or of ourselves endlessly. Uh, and particularly in my household, we had a camera, but I don't think we often used it. And we certainly didn't, didn't you know, you, you used to have to send away, didn't you? And then the film would come back and all of that kind of malarkey. We didn't do it much. And so the only picture, when they asked me for a picture, the only picture was that one. It, it's, it's fake news, though, because it's... That, um, I never had a green jumper. That's been colorized <laughs> by, by, by the publisher. Um, you know, this whole business of writing about the history, whether it's personal history or actual history, of course, changes come in and become then part of... So I, now, I now appear to have had a green jumper, but I never had a <laughs> green jumper. Uh, but anyway, apart from that, the entire book is entirely honest and true and all the rest of it. Um, shall I talk a bit about, about, uh, about it and, and, and why I wrote it? Um, can I apologize, first of all, for not having worn socks? I didn't realize how prominent my ankles were going to be, but I come from, <laughs> from England, which is a country in the desert, uh, <laughs> where we, don't, we, do, we dispense with our socks in England, uh, and um, along with a lot of other customs that we used to have, like you know, crouching out of the rain. In fact, it's increasingly a sort of place that is inhabited by elderly men in town squares playing bool and, uh, and women folk who wear black and when their husbands die have affairs with a local priest and those who sort of, who kind of adopted a sort of Mediterranean approach to life, which I think in many respects will suit us rather well uh, uh, if, it, if it carries on. Anyway, so that's, uh, sorry for not wearing socks. I really didn't realize that, um, that, that it was still possible to live in an ordinary kind of rain-filled place. But I, I should, of course, have looked up something more about Scotland before I, before I came. Um, the book, I wrote the book because I wanted to write um, about how odd it is that in the modern era, we do two things. We judge each other really, really brutally based on a snapshot of who a person is. And then we also use that judgment for the whole of that person's life. So we misunderstand ourselves in, in two ways. We, number one, we, we have this vision of someone which we think tells the entire story of who they are. So in my case, you know, posh, um, white, middle-class guy from the south of England who went to a private school, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and in many respects, and is privileged by all of those things. And in many respects, that is a, a true picture, because I am all of those uh, things, um, more or less. But, but there is a, a backstory to me, as there is a backstory to all of us, that actually is much more complex and nuanced than that. I was very struck when I was based in, in America for the BBC. Someone was telling me that Obama, who was an Obama advisor, so we don't think anything of David Cameron, we think he's an idiot, and we think he's, he's um, 
Uh, he's just a posh guy. He's had everything given to him on a plate, etc., etc., etc. And in many respects, it, their assessment of Cameron, you could argue, was a perfectly reasonable one. But they didn't know. I then got into discussion with this guy. They literally didn't know that David Cameron had a child who was very, very ill. And the child, of course, went on to die. Um, they knew nothing about that side of of Cameron's background. And it seems to me that in our kind of social media obsessed, identity obsessed era, we don't tell full enough stories about each other. We don't understand fully enough about each other. But the other thing, and I talk a lot about my mum in the book, who we'll doubtless get to in a bit, is people during the course of their lives change. And that's not a bad thing. We change our minds about things. We change who we are. Um, uh, and, 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 and we should be encouraged to, to do that. Um, we come in and out of politics. We, kind of, you know, we come in and out of our views of the world. We, and and that, that's, that's all an entirely good thing. So I wanted to write a book, really a book about coping, actually. It's absolutely not, as you said rightly, because it's, I see it as a comedy, really, a kind of social comedy of the 1970s, and about how it is that we all survived the 70s, those of us who were alive and functioning then, uh, and, and how um, the, the coping side of things is not about victimhood, and it's certainly not about blaming, and I say expressly in the book, no one is to blame for anything that happened in it. it, it it's, it's about the underrated um, uh, side of our uh, humanity, which is our ability to box and cox, to cope with adversity, to survive in spite of it, and sometimes to prosper in spite of it. And all of it happening in this weird, weird era, the 1970s, which, you know, you're all too young to remember the 70s, I can see that. There. <laughs> but I tell you, I was, I was in a car with my daughter a few years ago, actually, my, my teenage daughter, and I was saying to her, I was talking about the depredations of my youth and saying, you know, when daddy was young, uh, we didn't even have a car. And my daughter looked up from her book and said, oh, when were they invented? <laughs> uh, you, you realize to, to a young generation, the 70s were an awful long time ago, and we did things differently then, and my goodness, we did. Um, and there are all sorts of aspects of the 1970s that I write about in the book that are just inconceivable now. We'll probably end up talking a bit about my peculiar school. I went to a Quaker school, but it was a Quaker school in which there was a lot of bullying. You know, that great Woody Allen line about how... I was so weedy when I was a child, I was beaten up by Quakers. And I actually was, <laughs> I, I, I was beaten up by Quakers. Uh, uh, and and, and that, that kind of sense of how childhood wasn't properly invented in the 1970s. I was just talking to someone earlier about um, uh, rugby, and we may well talk later about masculinity and rugby, which is a part of the, of, of the book and a part of something I, I'm interested in. In, but I remember playing rugby for the school. So how's this for health and safety? At the age of 16 or 17, I played for Winscombe Thirds. Winscombe is a village in Somerset near the school. I didn't get into the first team, the second team. The third team, and you can imagine in the 1970s, coarse rugby, amateur rugby, grotesquely violent. I mean, just staggeringly violent, gouging and punching, and absolutely everything goes. These guys are farmhands and laborers and people in their 40s many of them, and at half time, they would drink beer out of a watering can. So in the, <laughs> so in the second half, they'd be not only violent, but drunk as well. And we were sent as school children as kind of cannon fodder, just to go, they thought it would make us into men. Uh, and, and that sort of, that, that carelessness towards children, which also, of course, had its very serious grim side, the abuse, um, which Nikki Campbell has talked about mm -hmm. recently, the awful things that happened, didn't happen at my school, those things. But we had this sort of Lord of the Flies thing at my school where the teachers weren't abusive, they just weren't very interested uh, in, in what happened to us. And that sort of side of, of, of the 70s, that way in which we interacted with each other then or didn't, and also the class system. Uh, and we'll definitely be talking about my mum, but my mum grew up in a world... We always talk on the Today programme about social mobility as being a good thing. And, of course, it is a good thing. Be careful, with Casey. Yeah. Uh, we, we're all in favour of social mobility. But in order for people to go up, people, some people need to come down. And my mother, and particularly her mother as well, were downwardly socially mobile, which I think is a fascinating <laughs> sort of 
thing, it, it's just an interesting thing to see. Um, uh, she, she grew up in enormously um, wealthy circumstances in the mid-war period. Was her, her father was a uh, very successful journalist, the first editor of the Radio Times, a friend of Lord Reith, um, uh, editor of Titbits, which was then a very respectable uh, magazine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Probably still as much money in it, if, if indeed it still exists. But so that, that so so, and they had a, um, uh, a maid and um, a driver and a big house and and all the rest of it. And then all of it went. He lost all his money. He actually took a lot of the money. Is another 60s and 70s thing. He left my grandmother destitute and went to live in the National Liberal Club and spent the rest of the money himself, which a man could do, of course in those days, and my granny ended up in complete penury. Uh, when she died, left me 11 pounds in, in premium bonds. So that was, it was properly downwardly socially mobile, and yet protected, and this is the fascinating thing about the 70s, by an absolute innate sense that they were superior to everyone. Uh, uh, and that my mother thought the queen was common, because <laughs> uh, the Queen had allowed the cameras into Buckingham Palace, and she thought I was very vulgar, dear, very silly. <laughs> so, and, and, and it wasn't that kind of hyacinth bouquet, sort of um, nervy, um, peering out from the, the net curtains uh, um, uh, snobbism, where you're worried about what people... My mum didn't give a damn what people thought of her, because she knew in her soul, however much she was on the, the slippery slope downwards, in, in, in financial terms, she was superior to everyone, every man jack of you. And, and, you know, I grew up with that weird thing where we were getting poorer and poorer and more and more certain that we were on top of the world. Um, and so that, again, I think, is an, is an interesting thing, particularly in the 70s. Because, of course, in the 70s was the, the last era of proper stratification of society. We were not really that democratic. We actually did. You know, there's that, that um, uh, Peter Cook skit where he's sitting on the park bench and, he's, and he says, um, I'm a coal miner and I, I would have liked to have been a high court judge, but I didn't have the Latin. And my, <laughs> my mother enormously liked that because she didn't get the joke. She thought, well, no, obviously you didn't have the Latin, so you shouldn't be a high court judge. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was how life was in those days. We did not have social mobility. We properly didn't have it. And people like my mother benefited psychologically from the ability to hold their heads high. Uh, however unjust this is, I'm not, this, is not a, this is not a defense of, of, of the caste system, but my mother really did. Social class to my mother was a kind of caste thing. And you could not be jemmied out of, of where you were. So all of those things kind of mixed together, along with my own peculiar upbringing and a father who was very famous but I never met, um, uh, led me to think that it was something that, that might amuse. Lovely. Let's get a round of applause for that, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> if you're watching at home, this year's Edinburgh International Book Festival programme is Pay What You Can. So if you're enjoying yourself so far, please consider paying for your ticket or making a donation so that we can ensure future book festival events are available to as many people as possible. Can they get money back as well? If it does not <laughs> I think there's a thumbs up and thumbs down <laughs> buttons that will get monitored by yeah, the or end. Or swipe left or right or whatever. <laughs> That's something completely different, yeah, Dustin. <laughs> Let's not go there. Um, so we, we're going to have a quick chat, and then we will come to the audience. So um, do think of your own questions, and if you are online, you can type them into the Q&A box on your screens, and they'll come through to this little gadget in my hand here. We'd love to hear from you shortly. You've touched a little bit there um, on your mum, Justin, but you do say in the book that she was a snob of staggering proportions. I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit more about that. I mean, she, she says that you can get away with most things in the 1970s if you hold your knife and fork properly. Yeah, she told me from an early age, and actually, I mean, in many respects, she's probably right. She said, look, dear, it doesn't really matter about education. Don't worry too much about exams and things. Uh, <laughs> but you must hold your knife and fork properly. And if you hold your knife and fork properly, it'll be fine. And I have to say, you know, I'm pretty badly educated, actually. I have not a single O-level GCSE equivalent in, in any science. Uh, it took me three attempts to get maths O-level. Uh, but I still managed to get a degree in economics from the LSE. 
I mean, how would that be possible in this day? Now, I think you would have to get an A star, in, at least in, in A-level maths, to get in at all, to do, to do anything. So in, in many respects, I was the last generation of, of people who, to, for whom mum was probably just about uh, right. But she, she had this list of things that were unacceptable which was as long as your arm and longer still. And it started, weirdly, with begonias. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether some people also have a, have a horror of begonias. Where does that come from? So she thought begonias, these sweet little plants people put in their, in their front gardens uh, in, in suburbia, uh, she thought were just beneath contempt. Uh, uh, and it went on from begonias to any French word that had been anglicized. So uh, perfume had to be scent, uh, dentures had to be false teeth. Um, any word that was, was difficult to pronounce had to be pronounced in the most difficult way possible. So she, anyone who said controversy, it had to be controversy. Anyone who said hospitable, it had to be hospitable. Uh, um, and particularly the word which even to this day, if I get it in a BBC script, I have to cross it out, um, was uh, toilet. We could not say the word toilet uh, under any circumstances uh, ever. And, and uh, to, to, the, to the extent that um, it, it, it became a kind of... I, mean, I still can't bring myself to even now. I'm 61. Mum is long gone, um, but I know that uh, if she's looking down on us now, that the one thing she would not want me to do, she'd be happy to, to see me chatting with you about it, but on air, she would not want, want me to mention the word toilet, so I never ever will. Uh, and and, and it, it, it's kind of, those things really do stick with you for forever. What and pardon were huge issues. So my mother talked a bit like the Duke of Edinburgh used to, language was kind of used a bit of a bludgeon. What is it? What are, you, what are you talking about? And that was very much my mum's style. And if anyone said pardon, she would say, what? Uh, and I taught the two little girls who lived next door to us in our little suburban house in, in Bath. I said, don't, don't say pardon, say what? And, and we then heard one day the mother saying to the girls, don't say what, say pardon, which is actually then became a chapter in my book because my mother thought it was hilarious that this dreadful advice was being given, uh, which would only ever lead to them being unsuccessful in life, basically, uh, was being given next door by these people who she regarded as, as beneath contempt because they were lower middle class. So all of that stuff, and yet, and yet, at the same time, an enormous, genuine affection. I mean, an enormous love for me and affection for me and, and a devotion to, to bringing up a child. But also, she was a member of Amnesty International. She was a founder member of CND. Um, she loved Bruce Kent, the, the guy who, who was the longtime leader of CND. Um, uh, she loved Tony Benn. Um, I think partly because they spoke properly there. Yeah. And, <laughs> and she loved the idea of Tony Venn saying, oh, we've got to give power to the working classes. And she, she didn't actually want power to be given to the working classes, but she loved the, the, she loved the idea of it, and particularly when it was spoken in proper English, uh, as it was by Tony Benn, and a whole sort of range of socialists in the 1970s who spoke properly, as my mother would have, would have put it. So th there was this complication. She also became interested in ideas. She became a Quaker. Um, uh, she became very interested in sort of Eastern mysticism. She became a Maoist for a bit. She decided everyone should wear a uniform because it was simpler, dear, more sensible. Um, I told her she had an intense dislike of football, uh, which I've also inherited, actually, from her. I, I, I She's always silly. And there was a great moral panic in the 1970s about football hooliganism. Um, uh, and, and she thought, you just take away their ball. She, 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 she just stop them playing. Uh, she thought round balls should not be allowed to exist in, in public, and that could somehow be commensurate with a, a view of humanity that allowed people to, to express themselves, etc., etc. So she was a complicated person, but a person also on a journey, uh, as politicians say, on a journey towards a different place from the place she was when she was young. As we all are, and I, to me, the interesting thing about her is, is when you look at your own lives, when we all look at our own lives as we get older, there's that sort of sense of, yeah, you, it's a journey that's an acceptable thing, indeed a proper thing to do. How dull we are if we stay the same and all believe the same things that we believed when we, when we were young.
I mean, you speak so fondly and so affectionately about her today, and the book is, is full of that beating love throughout. But you also describe being sent to boarding school by her mm. as a crime. Mm. And you talk about the things that happened whilst you're at boarding school as being so awful that if they were to fill the courts with the awfulness of what happened there, the courts would, would burst. Why, why is mm. there no anger there towards your mum? Is it because uh, you were sent to escape something? Yeah, or is it something else? Because I think you know, the things we do to each other are almost always explicable um, uh, by virtue of the things that happen to us uh, and the times we live in. And I feel absolutely no anger at all towards her. I think she was, I think we all committed crimes against each other and probably still do in many respects, um, uh, but without necessarily much blame attaching. And I think she felt she wanted to, to allow me to escape. She felt that our peculiar household, and it was very peculiar and very lonely and very isolated. She thought boarding school would be wonderful. We used to read, she and I used to read together um, uh, the Jennings stories. I don't know if anyone remembers Jennings, Anthony Buckridge. So uh, it was all kind of merry japes and, and feasts in the dorm and kind of uh, masters who are a bit gruff but fundamentally kind. And then you go to boarding school and of course the masters, <laughs> they may be gruff or fundamentally kind, they're just not there. And you're all left to your own devices and there's an enormous amount of, of bullying and just sort of, just kind of collapsed because as our school mirrored the 70s. So there was quite a lot of drug taking and quite a lot of just a sense of complete um, uh, failure of anyone to be in charge of of anything. I write in the book about uh, the caving society at school, who, um, who were probably the, the biggest society in the school, and they had proper kit with the lights and the ropes and all the rest of it, and the dungarees that you wear out to go down potholes, and the school was in Somerset um, uh, in the Mendip, so a lot of, lot of holes to go down. And on a Saturday afternoon, the, um, the, the kids would go off caving and um, be expected back for tea. And there was no other knowledge of where they were. I mean, can you imagine in this day and age? And like this was told to me by the headmaster who arrived towards the end of the time I was at the school. And he, he described to me, when I rang him up to do a bit of research, he, he described to me how he arrived at the school and he said to, the, to a master he was with, who, where are those, these, these boys going? And the master said, well, they're, they're going off caving, but they're expected to be back for tea. And that, that <laughs> sort of that whole sense of just go off and do what you want. Um, had, a, had a, a, a real sort of um, uh, impact of allowing children to be as they wanted to be towards each other. And as we all know, that can occasionally mean um, being immensely cruel as well. And, and you know, I had a friend who blew himself up in the chemistry lab, to, after which there was no inquiry at all. In fact, his first words, he told me this when I rang him up, he said his first words after the explosion happened and they temporarily couldn't see, he thought they might be blinded, and then their sight came back and they were quite badly burnt. He, he turned to his friend and said, do you think we'll get away with this? <laughs> and, and, and as I say in the book, well, you, the answer was kind of yes, really, because you could in the 1970s. The school just hushed it up and said, yeah, don't worry, don't, don't be silly. And they were very annoyed with them for a bit. And then they, they left it there. And in this day and age, my goodness, there would be inquiries that obviously all sorts of statutory um, uh, bodies would be in, involved, and rightly so. But we were just sort of left our own devices. And I think that kind of sense of of, um, of the school. My mother didn't have when she sent me there. She, I, I, I genuinely don't think she believed it would be like that. And I was so sort of messed up psychologically by the time I got to the school that I was involved increasingly in a performance, which is an interesting thing about how children, people will maybe remember this, and when you're young, you do, without realizing that you're doing it, you become a performer for your parents in certain circumstances where the safest thing, you kind of naturally understand the safest thing for you is that the show stays on the road. And the safest thing for me was that my mother was okay and felt okay. So I, I hid from her from a very early age all the unhappiness I ever had. And I never told her about anything at the school that was going wrong. In fact, my letters home are just complete, utter kind of fake nonsense uh, about, about how things are going terribly well, even though they, uh, at various stages of the school, um, weren't. So there was a, a degree of fakery on my part that, that I think completely absolves her of any 
blame. And it's clear that your mum was, was very unhappy in her personal circumstances mm. too. And mm. if you've not read the book, mm. it's explained to us that it was just the two of you until mm. she replied to an advert in the New Statesman yeah. uh, from a man who was looking for a housekeeper. And she goes on to marry the housekeeper. But Justin, tell us what happens next. Well, about a week after they were married, she goes to their GP and she's worried because Charles, her new husband, has been uh, pouring the milk down the sink. He comes down in the morning, pours all the milk down the sink. And she thinks, well, that's something that a GP maybe ought to, to hear about. So she mentions to Dr. Neil, uh, um, my new husband just got married. My new husband, though, is pouring the milk down the sink. Now, Dr. Neil is also his GP and has been for some time. And he turned to my mother and said, this is why I'm terribly sorry to tell you, your husband is stark staring mad. And that, of course, in the 60s was a diagnosis. And that was a serious medical diagnosis. Uh, and that was, you know, for her, both the end and the beginning, in a sense, in that, in that she had to decide then, well, what do I do? I've married this guy in order to give, I mean, frankly, she, she was looking for financial stability of a sort that just wasn't available to a woman with a baby in 1961. Um, uh, but also, she was looking, I suppose, for emotional stability, which also wasn't plainly not going to be available from this guy. So what to do? And that then set off this sort of way in which she treated him, and she encouraged me to treat him, which was to push him to one side. She was always very proud that when I was very young, I turned to her once and said, Mummy, where did we get Charles? <laughs> um, with a kind of implication that could we put him back and perhaps, <laughs> perhaps get another one. Uh, and she, would rather, she rather liked the idea of that, I think, but it was very much her and me against him, which I don't think did him any favours, poor man, because he was seriously mentally ill, I mean, properly ill, really paranoid on a daily basis, desperately, desperately um, searching for a way through the world and kind of, in a sense, finding it in as much as we lived in this peculiar little box of a house, the three of us together, and he survived, but um, it wasn't much of a life for him any more than for us. And the way that you talk about mental health in the book, I find particularly striking. I mean, it's almost in language that feels uncomfortable now. Like when you use words yeah. like mad in the yeah. current context, it feels like, oh, yeah. you've gone over a line. But yeah. it's so, so truthful and so honest. You, well, you know, I think you do a very good job there. But what, would his life have been very different had he lived now compared to the 1970s? I think it would have been, because I think, I think you, you could have been open about it. I mean, the thing about the 70s and, and, and all these mental health things, um, we, we, there was a mixture, wasn't there? We were um, enormous. We found madness both very, very funny and very, very frightening. And there was a kind of, and, and actually sometimes both. And, and what we didn't do is ever interrogate people themselves who had mental health problems and, and find out what they felt. Because it, it was just felt that they weren't really players in all of this. They were talked about, but never too. I was really, I, 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 in fact, I mentioned in the book, I, reading Alistair Campbell's um, uh, diaries and, and his books that he's written about his depression. I mean, he's far, far less ill than my stepfather was. But it's really interesting to hear about what his description of what it feels like to be, to go through a period in your life where you are deeply uh, upset and deeply suffering. And nobody ever asked my stepfather that. It just would have been inconceivable. Um, and at one stage, you know, we, we had pushed him into a corner. He tried to kill himself on my 13th birthday, I, I think. And I, I, I write in the book, I'd, I was allowed to have um, Frosties once a year because they were bad for your teeth, dear but you could have them on your birthday. So I was allowed to have Frosties on my birthday. And my chief memory of that day is suddenly a lot of kerfuffle and an ambulance coming and me being moved out of the kitchen so that he could be brought down the stairs and then coming back in and finding that the Frosties were limp. And that was actually the only real impact that, that him trying to kill himself had on on me, so you know, it's it's we were all deranged in as much as he was, poor man, trying to kill himself. But I was also in a situation where I was so removed from him, and my mother was so removed from him, um, and the medical profession as well. I can remember I have this memory of the doctor on the phone saying, "Not too much of an attempt at resuscitation," which you know, again, you've got that sort of sense of we just want to be rid of him, and I think now we are. 
you know, to use that word inclusive, which is so much used in the modern world and so much used falsely, I think. But in this respect, I think we are much more inclusive of people who are going through mental health traumas. Um, whether he'd have better treatment now, I'm not, I'm not so sure, actually. I, I don't think we've really, really moved on a lot. He was given Valium, and that was pretty much it. Um, and he lived the rest of his life with basically coshed um, and, and kept under, um, which is a pretty miserable way to live. So there's a lot of personal history there about the 1970s, but there's a good bit of political history as, mm. as well. And I was really struck by your reflection that you don't much like the written histories of the 1970s. Yeah. You, you think they miss something. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I became a bit of a revisionist while I was reading the political histories of the, of the 1970s because, I mean, it is partly because of what was available to my to my mum and particularly her mother as well in, in terms of the, the comfort that was given by the stratification of society. So um, I can remember my, my granny, um, who was by now living in complete poverty in a rented flat in one room, but at lunchtime she would take a, a medicine bottle which she had filled with sweet white wine to a wimpy bar and she would be allowed by the wimpy bar staff, although there was no license, but because she was a gentlewoman, and she was obviously not causing any trouble, and she was rather smartly dressed, she was allowed to pour the sweet white wine into a mug that they brought and drink it with her, with her lunch. And I once said to my mum, my mum had said to me, um, among the many things that were, were banned and, and, and not, um, not to be done, was the drinking of sweet white wine with the first course of a meal, which said only working class people do. <laughs> I still never met a working class people who has drunk sweet wine, but I'm looking forward to, to the moment uh, when it happens. But so I said to my mum once, why, why is granny, if, if working class people drink sweet wine with a meal, why is granny allowed to do it? And my mum just turned to me and said, oh, granny's granny. Because of course, <laughs> there's this wonderful thing that you allow you, if you have this kind of sense of your own superiority, you can survive absolutely anything, and indeed you can change your mind about what is acceptable and not acceptable, just with a flick of a switch. Uh, and it's your job, and it's your right to, to do that changing of mind. So the, the 70s allowed people like my mum and her mum still to exist with some sort of dignity, even though they were on the slippery slope down. And it also, and I also think about this in, in the book, I think about the working class, but my mum didn't like those she regarded as lower middle class. She actually enormously liked working class people who were not seeking uh, anything more than what they had. So she didn't like, you know, she didn't like Mrs. Thatcher or Edward Heath, but uh, not politically particularly, although I think that was probably part of it, but just because they were both striving to be <laughs> something that they, they originally, when they were born, were, were not. And that was what she couldn't stand. But if people knew their place, if you were a horny-handed son of toil, then that was fine with my mum. And of course, it was still, you know, we were still unionised and stratified in that way. Uh, and there was still this sense in which um, people could lose themselves in a greater thing than themselves, whether it's a football crowd or a church or a union, where there is a mass of you and you all are part of it. And I write in the book about this kind of sense that when I was based in America, one of the kind of great myths of America, and it's, it is pretty much a, a myth, though it has a kernel of truth in it, is that in America you can go as far as your talents take you. They don't have a class system, they claim to themselves, and you can just have a, you have a far your abilities take you, you can get. Although, of course, psychologically, that means that if you end up in a trailer park in, in, in Wichita, um, it's your fault uh, what's happened to you. And you, you internalize then all the pressures onto yourself. What we had in the 1970s, and again, this isn't an argument for this stratification of society, but it just seems interesting to me that what we had in the 70s was the ability not only of my mum and her mum to feel superior, but actually also the ability of working people to feel, look, we can't get on because the system stops us getting on. I mean, get on financially and get on and become like that Peter Cook character, a high court judge if you want to. Those things are not available to us. So, you know, it's not our fault, it's the system's fault. And that kind of gives you a psychological freedom, it seems to me, that I think sometimes when we look back in the 70s, we don't understand actually how, how happy we were in this collapsing 
country. And I think there were aspects of the 70s that were perfectly, people were perfectly pleased with that we possibly in our histories of the 70s and in our, our, our view of it from now, we, we don't properly get. We come out to the audience now, so I can start to see a, a bit of an indication if people have questions for Justin and let the lovely people with the microphones make their way towards you. Uh, there's another one on my mind, though, which is you talked earlier about the boarding school and it being a Quaker school, and yeah. you talk in the book about how you have a great love of silence. Yes. And actually, for a man who's made his life <laughs> yes. from the spoken word in particular, you've never listened to a podcast. No. But we've got visions of you at home now, just in a chair, utterly mute. Is that, is that how, it, how it is? I'm about to have to start doing a podcast at the BBC, actually, oh. having never listened to one, uh, which is, uh, yeah... Um, I, I really do. So my wife listens to Radio 4, and I keep switching it off. Um, because I, not because I don't like the voices of my colleagues, of course, or they're possibly some... But I, I have this kind of... I have this sense of silence being your best friend. And I, I think that does come, a lot of it, from uh, a Quaker upbringing, where silence, certainly once a week for an hour, which feels a long time to a child, you have to be completely silent. And actually, my house also, my upbringing was completely silent. Um, we did not have any chat in my house. In fact, idle chatter, I think, was, was a lower middle class thing, so I don't think, I don't think it was allowed anyway. I can remember, and I write about in the book, my mother trying to interest me in music, which she thought at one stage should happen. So we had to sit in our sitting room um, uh, with... Our sitting room was made to be uncomfortable. Um, and of course, the sitting room—I call it a sitting room. You know, it was not a lounge. It was not a, I mean, all the various other words that you could use to describe a room. We had a, a sofa, which couldn't be a sofa or a settee. It, we called it a divan. Uh, <laughs> and we had a television, which had to be bullied into the corner of the room, so that if you needed to watch it, you had to actually move your your chairs round and 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 take things off it and switch it on, because we had to show the television who was boss. And we were a books <laughs> household, and we certainly weren't, weren't, weren't in, interested in the, in the TV. And that, so, so into this sort of really strange atmosphere, a record player was produced, and music was put on. And we had to sit like this, listening to it. I mean, I was very sort of nine or ten years old. Um, and, and, that's, and, and then when the music ends, there's a period of silent reflection about what you've just heard. And that kind of weird way in which um, uh, my mother in particular thought that, that everything should be divided into periods where something was allowed to happen and then it stopped and there were silences in between. And I think those are the kinds of things actually you really do genuinely take with you to your grave. I think for me, it, it's just part of me. Um, uh, I, I, so I, I always, always in my life have moved towards silence and long periods of silence in, in which I'm perfectly happy. Well, we don't want a long period of silence <laughs> now. So can I see some hands? <clears throat> There's a gentleman just there, thank you, with the glasses. Hello, yes. Um, I wonder whether there's a connection between being the secret son of a famous father on the one hand and sending fake news back to your mother from your school with your decision to become a news reporter for the BBC yeah. and a news presenter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, um, I think that's very true. So I, I discovered that he was my father. We were watching the TV and um, my mother, we were watching Children's Hour and Children's Hour ended and the news came on. It was a rather lugubrious looking man in a fawn suit. And my mother turned to me and said, that man's your father. And then she got up and went next door and made tea uh, behind the hatch that we, all little suburban houses in the 70s had these little hatches, so I could hear her clattering away. And I looked a bit more at Peter Woods uh, and tried to see if he looked a bit like me. Increasingly, I do look like him, actually, particularly at three in the morning, but I didn't much then. Uh, and that was the last thing my mother ever said to me about him. And it became, again, you know, people will recognize in childhood sometimes you know that there are things that you do not talk about. You just know. You don't need to be told. You know instinctively from an early age. And I knew that it was deeply upsetting to my mother. She felt shame 
it, was the, it was the 60s, the early 60s when she had me. There was still stigma, real stigma attached to her having me at all. Plus the upset of the fact that he'd deserted her and he was famous and all, all the rest of it, all these sort of added things. So we never ever spoke about it again. Um, except once where the Morecambe and Wise show came on late 70s, so I'm a bit older now. Don't know if people remember the newsreaders. It's the first time people had ever seen newsreaders' legs. Um, they all came on at the end and danced a little jig, Angela Rippon and people like that. And then my father comes on last and sings, there ain't nothing like a dame. And he's got an incredible low voice and finishes and the program ends. And we're sitting there, my stepfather, my mother, and me, and our chairs that we've turned around to watch the television. And my stepfather sort of cleared his throat, and my mother said, he had shoes like the Queen Mary. <laughs> and then we turned our chairs around, and I went up to bed, and that was the, that was the end of the, of the conversation. So, which is a, a long way of saying, I knew how to keep secrets, and I was discreet, and I was also a performer, because I knew that I wanted her to be okay, and that the way for her to be okay was for these things not to be uh, mined too much. Did I also know that there was something almost atavistic about, about wanting to be a communicator, of which he was a, a really brilliant example in the 60s and 70s, He's an incredibly successful tabloid reporter. I mean, the days when the Daily Mirror and the, and the Sun were, the kind of, were, were, were absolutely um, trailblazers in the world of news, and he, he had um, uh, jumped uh, with a parachute into Suez with troops, uh, the first time he'd ever worn a parachute, he, he, he convinced them that he could use a parachute and got onto a plane and parachuted into, can you imagine the health and safety issues that that would be in the modern BBC? But anyway, so he did it. So he was a brave guy and he was a very, very successful sort of swashbuckling uh, journalist. And I think partly I did, I did sense, albeit without ever really thinking it through, I did sense that there was a spirit of adventure somewhere back there that, that, in, that I would like to, um, to copy. I never thought about him. I never thought about him when I joined the BBC. Uh, certainly, um, I, mean, I, I almost coincided with him. Um, only a year or two separated the end of him and the beginning of, of me as a, as a trainee in 1984. I never thought about contacting him. There was something so deeply repressed or suppressed or whatever it ends impressed, is um, something had happened that, that kept me back, um, and kept me from doing it. But I, yeah, but there was possibly something somewhere that did make me think that, yeah, this was, this was at least it, it opened me up to the idea that it was a profession that I might want to do, or um, a, a trade that I might want to follow. We've got lots of questions coming in from the people who are watching online, mm. Justin. And I'm going to take one of those and then go to the gentleman just in the theatre seats mm. up there, if we can get a microphone to him ready to go. But the online person asks, how does Justin suggest we can do better enabling those without the various privileges he lists, for example, being white, posh, male, etc., to get their backstories out there? Because if we don't do this, how can the stories that do get out there be representative or comprehensive? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, that, isn't it? I think we do need to be understanding of the way in which everyone should be able to tell their story and more accepting of the range of stories that each individual has. I think that's a really important part of kind of modern life and actually something we do do better now than we would have done then. So there was, there was a lot of gatekeeping in those days and we've always got to be cautious I think about gatekeeping and about um, the inability of people to be given a stage in which to, to speak. And, and I, I think generally we are better now than, than we were but we also need to provide the stories. In other words, we as individuals, and I think younger people who tell stories as individuals, also need to be freed up to tell more complex stories than we sometimes do. I think we're obsessed with identity, and I think it damages us as, as, as individuals. I think it damages us psychologically, because we try to, um, and particularly this is a generations younger than, than mine, we try to adhere then to identities and try to be part of a club um, uh, and see ourselves. You look at America now and people who, who, who are in the Trump camp, often not because they genuinely believe, well actually they, they do believe, they convince themselves that the things that, they, that he says are true are true because the psychological benefits of being in that club are so huge to them. 
Um, and and I, I think we, we need to kind of pull ourselves back from joining these clubs and be able to, to separate out our own identities and talk about ourselves as people and as, and as human beings and the, and the warp and weft of that. So, yeah, I mean, I hope it, it can happen, but I think part of it comes from individuals being brave enough, actually, to say, look, this is me, and, and you know what? Nobody who reads this or knows this about me is going to be entirely happy with it. And you actually uh, cite Simone de Beauvoir in the book, mm. who in the 70s was talking about mm. the dangers of othering mm. and yeah. being so polarised. Yeah. I would love some questions for mm. some women just in response to that audience question, but we'll go to that gentleman first and then we'll come down here. Um, very much enjoyed your book, but at the end I was left pondering and wonder whether you ponder why you enjoyed then social mobility given your childhood. Were there any critical moments that helped or avoiding mm. them kept you on the, that upward yeah. trajectory? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think the answer is that it was still, as I was hinting at earlier on, it was still possible in the 1970s for people who, frankly, spoke like me, particularly in England, to, um, to get the benefit of the doubt. Um, and I think I enormously enjoyed the benefit of the doubt. So, you know, I was hopelessly badly educated and yet managed to get into not a university, but a good university, to do an interesting course. Those things, that would not now, I don't think, be, be uh, available. And, or, or, I mean, here's the thing, it, it, it is more democratic in as much as you would need now to show proper qualifications, and it would not matter that you um, spoke in a particular way. And that is a, a good thing, obviously. Um, and I think it was still a thing then that I was able to kind of benefit from, pivot off those, those things. Because the world um, uh, has changed, but had not changed much in 1979 when I left school, and 1980 when I went to university, or indeed even in 1984 when I joined the BBC. I tell a story in the book about going... One of the stories my mum used to tell me is, if you go, if you go to a really good hotel, yeah, um, you, or hotel, as she would have called it, uh, you, you, you can ask for anything, and, and they'll just get it for you. And one of the things that she remembered, was some dimly remembered thing with some unsuitable man in the immediate post-war period, going to a dance in London and walking past the Ritz and going in and asking for a boiled egg at three, three o'clock in the morning, and it, the boiled eggs being provided with no fuss at all. And this is... The, so I was walking past the Ritz it was kind of a year or two, a few years ago, as a footnote in the book. I was walking past the Ritz, and I was doing a corporate thing where I was wearing a suit and tie. You don't wear ties on the wireless. So I'd found my suit and tie. I'd been so long since I'd worn a proper shirt that I realized I was walking past the Ritz. I had a button missing. So I thought, I'll put Mum's theory to the test. And I went into the Ritz, and I said to them at reception, I'm terribly sorry, but I've got a button missing from my the top of my shirt. Is it possible to find a button and, and sew it on? Of course, sir, absolutely. We went to, we went to I was taken into a side room. Yes, it is. someone's found with a, with a needle and thread and it was sewed up and, and put on. There we are, so wonderful. Well, I'm glad to have been of assistance. I, thank you very much. And as I was leaving, I got a bit cocky. I said to the, to, the, um, to the guy at the front desk, I said, I'm a bit late now. Could you get me a taxi, please? And he said, yes, of course, Mr. Vine. We'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> and you realise that... <laughs> My mother, I'd love to have been able to tell my mother that story because I think by the end of her life she would have genuinely found it funny. She thought that I would have got everywhere through bearing and, and, and my, my gentleness of birth. But actually, of course, in the modern era, nobody gives a damn about that. What they're interested in is whether you're famous or not. And I was mistaken for someone. Jeremy was in those days at the, in his pomp when it came to fame. He'd just done Strictly Come Dancing or whatever. And, I, you know, you, you got this realisation that actually a lot has really, really properly changed and for the good. So anyway, that's a very long way of saying that I think now, actually, the things that led me to have the leg ups that I had are just genuinely not there. And I think in general terms, um, without wanting to kick away uh, the ability of other useless uh, white people <laughs> to get on, I think, I think it is a good thing. Thank you. We've got a question right in the front row here, and then any other hands, one right in the back, we'll be with you in a second. Um, you talked really eloquently, eloquently about human 
about communication and how important it is to um, have silence but also be able to communicate clearly. Do you feel as a, um, as a public speaker and as a journalist that you come, that you're able to come across the way, the way you want to come across? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Did I, no is the, is the honest answer, because you always feel, you always feel this sort of sense of, so if you look at kind of my day job on the Today program, there's an immense frustration, actually, I think it's honest to say, with, with the way that we communicate with each other in the modern era. I don't feel that we do a particularly good job of it. I think we're finding our way. We used to think that uh, aggression in interviewing, we went through a kind of Paxman Humphreys phase, which I think was a, a reasonable thing to do because we were way too supine before, where the thing to do was to say to this lying whatever, why are you a lying whatever? And that was the way interviews were conducted. Now we've kind of moved away from that and we've got to try to find a place that can be uh, um, combative when necessary and hold people to, to account when necessary, but also uh, um, conversational and properly communicative of all the things actually I've just been talking about, the complex complexity of, of individuals, the ability of people. We don't let people change their minds enough. We don't let politicians change their minds. We don't, you know, there's, there's this sort of sense of, of rigidity that I think I, I would enormously um, fight against. A plus from the point of view of, of the politicians, you know, just this awful, depressing kind of um, uh, media round that there is now where people just repeat talking points, even when it makes them look utterly ridiculous. And even when they know that there are six million people listening who all think you're a plonker, mate, uh, <laughs> they still go through it all because that's what they, they have the, the SPAD, the special assistant, has told them to do. And that is the way that political communication is right at the moment, where you're just trying to fire up your base and get your key messages and not engage at all in any kind of debate. And uh, that, that's, that's depressing. So I, I think there is a, I think we have a problem of communication at the moment from, from both sides, which is, you know, let's hope we can find our way through it. I'm not, I'm not pessimistic, because I think people are so sick of it, actually. I think the answer comes from, you know, from you and from all of us, actually, just saying, come on, we've had enough of this. We, we, we want something a bit more um, sustaining. So do you think the days of the 10 past eight slot on the Today programme could be coming to an end then if it is so performative and it's just a matter of getting those key lines? Well, I don't, we had a period where they boycotted us, the government boycotted us, and I'm not sure the audience terribly minded, frankly. We, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Going, moving on to the lady in the back there. Thank you. I'm really enjoying your book, and thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask you, would you recommend a, a media career for any of your family? <laughs> My son's doing creative writing at the University of East Anglia, which has got this course where a lot of you know, novelists have been part of it and are doing it, and he regards what I do with complete contempt. Uh, he's read, he, there are one or two lines in the books that he quite likes, but the rest of it he thinks is utter nonsense, really. And he, he, I, think, I think, to be honest, my... The, the great thing about my own children that I really feel proud of is that they couldn't give a monkey's about the book. Um, they're just not interested. And I, I, for me, having this kind of performative closeness to my mother, unhealthy closeness, um, albeit that, my goodness, she did her very, very best, and she did brilliantly, and she was enormously loving. But it, it, it's that, that closeness to one parent, or indeed to two parents, actually, that, that, that is... Um, uh, cloying when you're young. I never had the ability just to be a child. And I think one of the things I'm really pleased with is my kids, uh, none of them show the slightest interest either in what I do now um, or, uh, or, or, or want to follow in my footsteps, which is absolutely fine by me. My youngest daughter, I, I said to my, my wife a year or two ago, um, where's daddy? Can he take me to school this morning? Because I need to go in early. And Sarah t t turned to her and said, you know, that, that, that thing in the corner is the radio, <laughs> and that voice coming out of it <laughs> is your father, and, uh, which I thought was wonderful, actually. She hadn't noticed what I did for a living. 
and I'm all in favour of that. More widely, is it still worth going into the media? Absolutely. I mean, I hope people do. I just hope my own kids can find their own way. But I, 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 I'm, I'm actually not as, as, as depressed about the media and about the world of journalism as, as some people are. I think it's still an enormously worthwhile thing to do. And I think there are still lots and lots of people, including probably everyone here, who's interested in stuff and in serious discussion and have their own views and want to interact. And you, know, you look at the success of The Spectator and The New Statesman and The Atlantic and, and Sirius Radio too, and Radio 4, still incredibly well listened to. Times Radio, which has got an audience. I mean, there's a lot, not, I'm not talking about the kind of shouty stuff, the, the, the phone-ins and all the rest of it. I think we can do without all of that. But, but serious, serious journalism that approaches serious issues and, and, and tries to explore them, I think there's an awful lot of interest in still. Um, so that's a good thing, and I would absolutely encourage people to go into it, yeah. As we get towards the end of the book, and indeed to the end of today's session, we find you on the cusp of the 1980s, <laughs> which you describe as fizzing with modernity after the moribund and sclerotic 1970s, cloth-capped and coal-powered. We were going nuclear. Is there going to be a, a second book we expect <laughs> the 1980s yeah. to be coming our way? Yeah, no, I don't remember much about that. I was so obsessed with my career in the 1980s. It's awful. I, I don't really remember much about it. And I, I, I don't think I could. I don't want to write this sort of conventional uh, journalistic memoir of, you know, where you went and what you did and the bullet came this close and all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, Partly because I wasn't very good at it, frankly. I mean, I did. I, I had this terrible. I know Alan Little's here somewhere, and he and I were in Bosnia together. And my, my kind of that, the high spot of my my career in Bosnia was when I was doing a live section for breakfast television from a field in Bosnia behind the house where we were holed up, and there'd been a gun battle over our heads all night. Really, I mean, with with heavy weapons, they used to fire anti-aircraft guns kind of across and, and enormously noisy and, and frightening and, and really good television, which is what I thought. So I got out in front of it, put the flak jacket on and the helmet and I was saying, you know, I thought my goodness is going to make me look quite the man uh, as it goes out on breakfast TV. And I, and I, I thought I did my bit quite well, sort of slightly flinching when things came past. And at the end of it, I could see halfway through the cameraman looking absolutely horrified and I, I, I couldn't see, obviously, I couldn't ask him why I was doing this thing. So we finished, and we sort of ducked down and went back inside to the relative safety. And I said, what happened? And he showed me the tape. And halfway through, I'm doing this sort of ducking and diving thing. A woman wearing an apron <laughs> walks without a care in the world into the field behind with a basket of washing <laughs> and, and hangs it on a line. One shirt here, one shirt here, one shirt here. And I mean, that was the high spot, really, of my, of my kind of journalistic <laughs> career. So I'm not about to do a whole book about that sort of stuff. Well, I would like to write a book about how, you know, life is in, in later years, but I've, I've yet to find exactly what the kind of format for it is. And I'd love to write fiction, but I, unfortunately, I've got absolutely no imagination at all. So um, uh, I, I, I very much it, I doubt it's coming. So I fear. So the, the short answer is probably not. I think this is it. <laughs> well, Justin, thank you. And to everybody who hasn't got a copy yet, The Gift of a Radio is available in the Book Festival shop. And if you do have a copy and you'd like Justin to sign it, he will be available in the signing tent shortly after today's event. This is a book full of heart and humour, so please do pick up a copy. And that leaves us with nothing else to say other than a sincere thank you to thank Justin you, and a sincere thank you to thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.